trying out my new microphone set. So for the first people who pop on board, if you don't mind letting me know if you can hear me okay or not, just so I know I've got things hooked up properly. And I'm just gonna click around here, make sure I've got everything I need it to be. All right, folks, as you jump on board, I'm using a new microphone. So if you can kind of give me a thumbs up in the comment section, if you can hear me properly, if I connected this thing the right way or not. <laughs> well, we've got a good group forming, that's for sure, hanging on board. All right, guys, yes, you can hear me. Oh, good, 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 good. Susan can hear me, Eric can hear me. Hey, guys, and I've got your questions ready for tonight. So stick around. Thank you guys for letting me know. Hey, Daniel. Hey, it's Mark S. How you doing? <laughs> Sorry, guys, I got some crazy hair going on tonight. We've got Kay Levinson. Oh, good, and Kay, you're watching me from my YouTube channel. Awesome. we got Ashley on board, nice and cold. Susan, good evening. Hey, Benny. We got Bonnie. Susan, okay, Benny's on my YouTube channel, guys. Hey, Mark K. We got Mark S. and Mark K. on board. Okay, good. Trent can hear me all good. Good. So I connected this thing properly on the first try. Go me. <laughs> hey, David, what's going on, man? Hey, Brett. So guys, those of you who are watching the replay, if you don't mind putting replay into the comment section, I always kind of like to see uh, who's watching the replay and, and make sure I get the comments and any questions that might come in afterwards. We got Jim coming in from St. Louis. Oh, Susan's on board. Oh, Susan, it was my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Uh, Jennifer, and we've got Glenn on board. Excellent, guys. Excellent. Okay, so just so you guys know, Oh my gosh, Johnny, you are killing me. He says, Johnny V from Poughkeepsie in the Cozy Talks Love Shack for individuals affected by limb loss. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, I feel like I should have that song Love Shack playing in the background now, Johnny. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Hey, Lori from Ohio. Lori, I don't recognize your name. So this is your first time. Welcome. We've got Tom McIntyre on board. We got Chris from Iowa. Jess, hey, Jess, you're back again. Glad you could join us from Wisconsin, Pat. Pat, you got your IPA going? You got your IPA? Uh, let's see, we got Stephen from Boston. Congratulations to the Bucks. Thank you, sir. City of Tampa and Tom, despite stealing our quarterback. I'm gonna pretend I didn't read that, Stephen. I guess Tom just likes the warmer weather. Yeah, yeah, that was a great game. That was a great game. Sorry, Kansas City. Y'all just couldn't get those, uh, those penalties under control. <laughs> And that's all I have to say about that. I don't want to start a scuffle here on Cozy Talks. Hey, Sandra, how you doing? We got Clarence on board. Negative 10 degrees with Chris Brakes. That is insane. We're in the 80s here in Tampa. Mine, cayenne kombucha. Mujer, what is that? <laughs> we got Linda on board from Hurley, New York. And Benny is taking a break from making cascarones. Oh. <gasps> Oh my gosh, cascarones. I haven't heard that in a long time, Benny. Hey, Robin, we're here. Thank you, Lena. It was a really great game. Hey, Casey. Man, we have got a nice full group here on board. Glenda's got vanilla latte and her cozy cup. Oh, you got your cozy mug on board. How many of y'all here have a cozy mug? How many, are, how, how many of you here are cool kids have a cozy mug on board? <laughs> Pat's got his IPA. I knew it. I knew it. All right, guys, so uh, what I was trying to say is I am now broadcasting live both to my Facebook and my YouTube channel, both under the name of Cozy Talk. So for folks who are not on Facebook, uh, who don't particularly like Facebook or have trouble maneuvering and finding my live show, which has happened before, I think it's a little easier sometimes for folks to find me on YouTube. So guys, if you have any people who have been trying to join in, but they've been having some trouble finding me, direct them to my YouTube channel. Uh, Cozy Talks. And again, keep checking in. If you're not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, go ahead and do that, like click on a new tab thing and sign up and subscribe. I've got a lot of really cool stuff coming out uh, in the next month or two. And I'm so excited about what I'll be doing with the YouTube channel. We got Dick Devers. Dick, I haven't seen you in a long time. We got Sue from Englewood. Olga, working with the right ear and listening to you with the left. <laughs> Drinking Cherry Coke Zero. Aw. All right, guys. Oh, you don't know where to get one. You guys, I think I still have a few mugs left on my website. So if any of you are interested in grabbing a Cozy Talks mug, there's a, there's a couple I think I still have left in my inventory. So uh, let's see, we got Daryl from Icy, Indiana. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead. How do you get a Cozy Cup, Casey? You can go to my website, www.cozytalks.com. Basically, I just put the cups up there to, to for sale and just to pay for, for shipping. So lots of fun with that. Hey, Sam, how are you? Glad you could join us. 
All right, guys. So for those of you joining me for the first time, and I see some new names up there, welcome. My name is Cosi Belloso. I am a physical therapist and PT specialist. I have been a physical therapist now for 18 years. Ooh, long time. And I have a clinic here in Tampa that is exclusively for working with amputees, teaching them how to use their prosthetic devices, walk and run sometimes with those prostheses. So guys, we have, I am a happy PT tonight because I've got lots and lots and lots of questions and lots of really different questions and a couple of new ones that I've never had before on the show that I was just like, ooh, this is new topic. So I'm gonna jump right in. All right, Eric, you got this question to me today. Eric says, my socket fits tight. The knee is great. I have an Alex too. The therapist says, I'm as strong as an ox, but my gait is still off. I walk great with a cane, but once I try without the cane, I sink to the side and this should not be happening. You're absolutely right, Eric. That is definitely a gait deviation that for a young man your age or any amputee, because I, I, I expect just the same from my, from my older folks as I do from my younger folks should not be experiencing. So a couple of questions, Eric. A, when was the last time that your physical therapist actually did manual muscle test on you? And this has happened to me. So guys, when a physical therapist first evaluates you, and sometimes even your prosthetist, they might conduct what's called manual muscle testing. And that's basically just a fancy way of saying how we measure the strength of your muscles. And we will put you in specific positions so that we can isolate a particular muscle group, okay? And it's happened to me on occasion where I'll have a patient come in, I'll see them walking, and I'm like, oh yeah, their muscle strength is fine, it looks good. And then I'll be like, let me test them officially. And sure enough, when I put them on the mat, put them in the right position and I isolate one particular muscle, boom, I find a weakness right there. So in the young population, the younger population, I'm talking about my folks who are 50 and under, okay, that can happen a lot. So hopefully your physical therapist has done a recent manual, manual, manual muscle test. <laughs> specifically on your glutes, Eric, because usually when you've got someone who's listing to the side like that, we call that the Trendelenburg gate, okay? And that basically means glute weakness, which is probably the biggest culprit in all weakness for amputee walking, okay? So number one, ask your physical therapist to really do a specified manual muscle test to see if there's, they can pinpoint which muscle is weak. Number two, if your socket is tight, you need to check your socket. Okay, your socket should fit snug. It should fit like a well-fitting glove. It's a Goldilocks situation, not too tight, not too loose. Okay, if your socket is too tight, it could be that you're putting on too many socks and you're elevated out of your socket, which could cause all this kind of funny business when you walk. Okay, because you're essentially making yourself higher in that socket, which makes the leg feel longer and then your body's going to do funky things to try to compensate for it okay so if there's something going on with your socket that's not fitting properly your therapist needs to take a look at this and if your therapist isn't as familiar with working with amputees and managing sock socket fit then you need to have this conversation with your prosthetist to help you troubleshoot all right so the other thing eric and this happened to me i had a new consult patient today and i'm going to call him the stud muffin this gentleman came in, he's in his 70s, and I call him the stud muffin because he really is strong as an ox. I tested every muscle in those, in those legs and his residual limb and in his sound leg, and boom, he got the highest scores for manual muscle testing. The man's amazing, right? But when he's walking, he's having some problems and gait deficiencies. And in his case, it was coming from a lack of balance, okay? And because of things that went on in his history, and I dug a little bit more and I realized, okay, you've never really worked on your balance and you've never really hit your proprioception. And that is what was causing him, okay, to have these gait deviations, okay? So Eric, a couple of things for you to test. I'll do a little recap for you. Have your physical therapist ask them, hey, what was my latest manual muscle testing score, right? And if it's been a couple of weeks, they might wanna test you again just to see if there's been any changes, right? Or if they can isolate a particular muscle group that's weak, okay? Number two, get that socket checked out. Get that socket checked out. It should be comfortable is the word I always go for. It should be comfortable, okay? Especially if you're an active individual. 
Number three, balance exercises. And Eric, actually, ooh, I get a chance to show this off a little bit. Uh-oh, don't tell me you lost my sound. Oh, dear. Oh. Y'all, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Jeez, oh, I'm hearing crickets here. Yes, yeah. okay, you guys can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Andrea, then I think it's just you that lost me. Okay, thank you guys, thank you. Okay, so guys, let me just, for Eric and for any of you who would like to also check this out. Oh boy, now I get all the yeses in there, awesome. <laughs> all right. So Eric, if you go to my YouTube channel, which I just posted, thank you guys, I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll be able to see a couple of balance exercises that I have in there. And Eric, yeah, Andrea, I think it's you, babe. Um, Eric, the one I want you to pay particular attention to is called the braiding exercise, okay? So it's a, it's a, it's a nice complex balance exercise, and then I break it down into the simple steps to start off with. Okay, Brett, so that should hopefully, not Brett, I'm sorry, Eric, I keep saying Brett. Eric, to get you started, if the balance is what's affecting you. And then last but not least, okay, last but not least. And again, this happens a lot in my younger population because in some ways you progress very quickly, but in other ways, you know, you're still an amputee trying to recover. The, you will hit a plateau sometimes. Sometimes your strength might be chugging along nicely, but you can't get off the cane. You can't get off the cane. You can't get off the cane. And it does take time to build that balance and to get that fine polish and be able to let go of the cane. And Eric, you're not the first one that that would happen to. Okay, so you got your homework assignment. I give you a bunch of homework assignments to do. And I want you to get back to me and let me know how it goes. Okay. Hey, we got Grant on board and I missed like a ton of just comments here, guys. Let me just scroll on back, make sure I'm saying hello to everybody. We got Sue from Angle. Okay, yep, I met Sue from Englewood. All right, are we good? Hey, Barbara, and we got William Mays from Richmond, Virginia. So Jim and a couple people are saying that they've never been tested. Okay, Eric, so she did test you today. Okay, so if she says that she did not find any deficits in your manual muscle testing skills, Eric, then I guess the next step would be A, get the socket checked. Definitely get that socket, make sure that you are in it properly with not too many socks, or perhaps you've outgrown the socket a little bit. If you gained a tiny bit of weight, troubleshoot this with your therapist and with your prosthetist, okay? And then last but not least, balance. Lots of balance exercises, lots and lots and lots. Hey, Harsh, all right, let's see what we got. Susan says, how do you test for butt muscles? Very good question. So Bob, come here. Bob got no butt muscles, but he will hopefully be able to teach. To, he, he can hopefully lend a hand. So guys, the traditional way to test for butt muscle, the gluteus, let's call it the gluteus, um, we put the patient on their belly. And granted, there are some of my patients who, who do not tolerate being on their belly. Um, so there's a couple of different positions, but the basic position is people are lying on their belly and I will ask them to lift their residual limb up. Now, and then I put a little pressure on it to see how much pressure they can tolerate me pushing down. So depending on how much pressure they can tolerate will determine what score they get on the manual muscle test. And also as a therapist and clinician, when we're doing these manual muscle testing, we're also assessing to see how the joint moves. So for example, if someone's got a really tight hip, meaning right here, they got a lot of tightness here, they're not going to be able to really lift that leg back, right? And that can tell me a little bit about their hip mobility, okay? If, for example, they start lifting uh, their leg back and then they start arching their back, which Bob can't do that, he's got spinal fusion, all right? So that's also telling you something about what's going on there, okay? So there's a lot you can learn as a therapist, a lot you can tell about your patients when you're doing the manual muscle test. Bob, don't get fresh, let's go over here, all right? And yes, guys, there is a way that we isolate the gluteus maximus from the gluteus medius and minimus. There's a sideline position. So there's a couple of different positions we can put our patients in to really kind of try to pinpoint a particular muscle. All right, here we go. Let me scroll on down. Okay, Eric said we did a balance test and it was good. Eric, what kind of a balance test? Because I know, and as therapists, again, we have tests for balance and the patient might do well there, 
but then when you put them, I like, I have a, personally, I have an optical course kind of thing that I do with my patients when I'm really trying to challenge their balance. So Eric, if you get the chance, go to that YouTube channel that I just, my YouTube channel to the braiding exercise and just take a look and see what that exercise looks like. And just think about if you're able to do that or not. And again, Eric, if they've checked your balance, they've checked your muscle strength, then it's coming possibly from the socket, okay? And again, when I work with my patients, part of what I have to be able to differentiate is what's coming from the socket, what's coming from the patient, right? And if you guys have watched the video I put out of my patient, Chris, he's been such an amazing patient model the past couple of weeks, and he's such a good sport. I got to give Chris a shout out, man. This guy has been working so hard, so, so hard. It has been five years, guys, and he's allowed me to share this information. It has been five years since his amputation, and he has been wheelchair bound the entire time. He never had physical therapy, unfortunately, when he first had his amputation. So when he come, came to see me for the first time, he hadn't stood in five years, five years. That's a long time. And as you could see in the video, you could tell in the past couple of weeks, I've been putting out videos of his progress. He's definitely still got a lot of work to do and he's working really, really hard to do these activities, but it's amazing. Now, if you look at his videos, you're going to see that his socket and his alignment ain't that great, <laughs> okay? And right now, we're starting to come up on the limitations because the socket is not fitting properly and he does not have very good alignment. So thankfully I was able to find him an amazing prosthetist and I've been working with him and we're gonna get Chris fixed up and ready to go. But Eric, my really long winded point is to say that it, if, if the socket is not fitting properly and if there's something off about the alignment, then it's going to affect your gait, even if you're super strong and your balance is super good. So you kind of help narrow that down right there. And it could be time to give your prosthetist a phone call and just describe what it is that you're feeling with the tightness in that socket. Savvy? All right. Okay. Eric says I'll be back in Florida in March. Sweet. Um, hey, Stephanie, how are you? And then we've got Susan that says my bursa is inflamed in the butt area and femur area. And yes, guys, uh, the bursa is basically a fluid filled sac and we have several bursa located throughout our body nearby our joints. And usually these bursa are located um, near the joints and specifically between tendons and it kind of acts like a nice little cushion and lubrication to allow the tendons to move smoothly. And there's one sitting there on the right side on, on the outside part of your hip. So in women, especially, it can get inflamed and cause a nasty bursitis. And that's usually sometimes due uh, to weakness, especially in women. It's due to weakness, uh, specifically also of hamstrings um, and weakness of the glutes. So that area gets hot and bothered. All right, let's take another question. I've got the question here. Ah, okay, Steve. Steve, I think I saw you on board. Steve, you got that question at the last minute, and I'm going to answer it for you as soon as I take a sip of my coffee. Ah. Y'all drinking my favorite coffee. It's like, it's, it's, it's called, I forgot what it's called. It's Java something or other. It's so good. No, Jamaican me crazy. That's what the name of the coffee is. So good. All right, Steve, your question. It says, in my ongoing buy a new leg project, I had a conversation with an engineer uh, from a socket company today. He made a remarkable statement to me. He says, the weight of your body should not be supported by your residual femur alone. Is that true? Yes. And here's, here's what happens. So when you have um, a, an amputation of the lower extremity, okay, that bone is not meant to support the weight of your body uh, the way it used to, okay? The exception being, if you are a signed amputation, meaning you only had your foot removed, or if you are a knee disarticulation, okay? And as a knee disarticulation, y'all can see here Bob's bone, okay? You basically are removing the tibia, this big bone, and the fibula, okay? The femur is completely intact. And with the signs amputation, hopefully you can see, right? We remove the foot, okay? But these end bones, the malleoli, stay intact, okay? Those folks, are able to do weight bearing through the end of their bone, okay? 
And this is probably where socket technology has, man, I got some crazy hair today. This is where socket technology has improved since say, you know, the earlier part of this century, okay? Way back when, you know, with the, with the more ancient prosthetic devices, people were putting weight right into the end of their residual limb and it would cause enormous amounts of pain, wicked amounts of skin problems and breakdown and just really nasty side effects. So as sockets started to kind of evolve, they, are, they were made to take the pressure off the femur, okay? So in your below the knee socket and in your above the knee socket, the socket um, puts the pressure more into the soft tissues. So it distributes the body's weight through the soft tissues, okay? Now, are there consequences to this? Yes, and the biggest consequence that I can think of right now is osteoporosis, okay? So those of you who've watched my show have probably heard me talk about something called Wolf's Law, okay? Wolf's Law basically states that in order for bone to keep forming and turning over those bone cells to keep reproducing, right, there needs to be stress added to the bone, right? Stress added to the bone stimulates bone production. So how do we add stress to the bone? By weight bearing, by walking by muscles pulling on that bone and causing tension on that bone. And that's what stimulates our bones on a daily basis to reproduce and to, to, to cycle over again, okay? So that's why now we're starting to realize in women and men who become osteopenic or osteoporotic that one of the treatments is to prescribe weight-bearing exercises, weightlifting, so that we can stimulate that bone turnover. Okay. Now for an amputee, that's obviously very difficult to do. Why? Because that bone is not getting any weight bearing. And on top of that, the muscles that are attached to that bone are now either cut or they're missing or they're attached in a very different manner. So they're not providing that muscle tension to the bone to help stimulate that bone formation. Okay. Now as a caveat note, and I will be very excited to see what the long-term studies show. It'll be interesting to see that what happens with patients who develop, um, who undergo osteointegration. Okay, now osteointegration, I'm like, whoo, going off into a tangent here, but just stay with me for a moment, right? Osteointegration is the relatively, relatively new um, procedure where they insert a rod into the femur itself, into the middle of the femur, and then it comes out the end of the, the residual limb and the prosthesis attaches directly to that. So there's no need for a socket. Now, in the case of that, when you're putting that rod directly through the femur, that essentially is creating weight bearing into the middle of that femur, okay? So it'll be interesting, like I said, to see long-term studies to see if they see any return on that and, and prevention of osteoporosis. All right, guys, let's see. I see some comments coming in here. Casey says, I need some cafe con leche. Oye, Casey, you gotta get that spelling right, man. If you want cafe con leche, you gotta at least spell it right. <laughs> Steven says, thank you. It explains a lot of the issues prevalent with my current leg. And again, guys, you've heard me use the expression bottoming out in your socket, okay, which basically means that your residual limb is hitting the bottom of your socket and your femur or your tibia is taking the weight. And that's a big no-no. We do not want that. Again, the exception being if you're a knee disarticulation, if you are a Symes amputation, and I forgot to mention if you've had an ERTL procedure. Ertl, E-R-T-L, okay? And that's a specialized amputation, below the knee amputation uh, that was created by Dr. Ertl. And it allows for weight bearing at the end, okay? Next, Glenn says, don't forget about us OI people. We support our weight with our femur. Glenn, I didn't forget you. I just was long-winded to get to my point. <laughs> All right. Oh, and Susan says, I have at least two OI patients here. And that's great, guys. You know, so again, it's, it's a very, and from what I understand with OI patients, the couple I've been able to speak to, and, and you guys, if you guys want to chime in on this, is when the person has had OI after using a socket for so many years that they notice that it feels different. Like they're, they're, they're really putting their weight in their leg. Like that's kind of the sensation that I've heard described to me by folks who have had OI. So I'll be curious to see if you guys uh, agree with that or not. 
Uh, let's see, here's a quick question. Uh, Brett asks, it's been over three months since my left above the knee amputation. I know everyone is different. Shouldn't I have a prosthesis by now? Okay, and guys, this is something that I see ranges all across the board. So way back when, I think in the 80s, even before then, long before I was practicing, that's for sure. <laughs> um, when a person had an amputation, they were put into what was called an IPOP. So an immediate post-op prosthesis. And it was basically just a real rudimentary, uh, quickly casted check socket and just a kind of a, a peg leg, just, just a simple leg and a wooden foot attached to it so that the person could start standing immediately after surgery. And then that fell out of trend for a while and they didn't, they stopped doing that for a while. And now I'm starting to hear a little whispers here and there of some surgeons that like to do that, that they like to provide their patients with the option of having early weight bearing right after amputation. Okay. For the most part, for the most part, surgeons like to wait until the surgical incision is healing. So usually in the first four to six weeks, and then they'll refer the person out to the prosthetist to be fit. Now, if you're someone who had a complicated wound healing process, if you've been battling an infection, whatever the case may be for complications with healing, the surgeon might want to hold off because they don't want to add another stressor to your leg by walking around on a prosthesis. And again, everybody deals with this a little differently. But yes, Brett, if it's been three months and your surgical incision has healed and you've had no other issues, then it's time to give that surgeon a call and have him prescribe you to go see the prosthetist and to go see your physical therapist. All right. Leanne says, how would you know if you have an ERTL? Um, an ERTL procedure, again, it's a very highly specialized procedure. Not as many surgeons here do it. So if you had one done, you would know about it. Um, it's basically, and again, I don't see too, too many patients. Excuse me, Bob. All right, so it's for the below the knee amputation. This is the bone on the outer part of your leg, the fibia, and this is the big shin bone, your tibia, right? So with the ERTL procedure, they'll make the amputation and then they'll create a bony bridge. Okay, so they'll take some bone and graft it here so that basically where my finger is, is kind of like the little bony bridge, okay? And it bridges and it kind of holds these two bones together, okay? Versus in a traditional amputation where, you know, they make the cut here and then these bones are not attached to each other. So they're kind of floating around basically in your soft tissue. So improving that bony bridge there kind of anchors it and allows for weight bearing on the end. And again, I've heard mixed, I've heard mixed, um, I haven't heard too many people who have had it done. Um, I've had some people who've had it done that they think it was a really wonderful, successful procedure and it was great. And you know, the occasional person that they said, mm, you know, it didn't seem any different to them than a traditional amputation. And it is something I would like to learn a little bit more about myself actually. Let's see, Jill says, that's one reason I'm fearful to let go of the cane. Three years of non-weight bearing and I was negative 3.3 DEXA scan. Yeah. At age 58, three years after the amputation of 55, now 61, but no longer fat and on the walker. And again, Jill, you know, you definitely had, you're on the osteo, osteoporotic end. So guys, DEXA scan is what they use to measure the bone density. Um, there's a couple of different ones. There's a SEXA scan and then there's a DEXA scan um, to screen for this. So Jill, if you haven't had an updated scan, um, if, it ha if it's been 58 to 61, so yeah, it's been about three years. You might wanna go get a repeat scan just to kind of get an update on your uh, bone density and then also weight bearing exercises, Jill. And also, you know, that some of the medications that they use to help with osteoporosis can be pretty strong with some pretty strong side effects, um, but they also can be very effective. And it could be in some cases that you might go on these medications for short term until the bone density kind of perks up a little bit and then you can go off it little by little. Uh, and Jill, a big, you know, and I can understand your, your wariness for not wanting to let go of that cane for safety issues. Let's see. Glenn says, I agree with that. It takes some time to get used to weight bearing with OI. Yeah. And it's a pretty long, it's, it's a very intense recovery, um, very strict protocols. I am very uh, happy to see uh, the protocols that the U.S. surgeons are doing with their OI patients, that they're being extremely meticulous with the rehab process, which makes me so very happy um, to see a wonderful team approach to make sure that everyone gets the best possible outcome. Uh, let's see, 
Linda says, sometimes my, my socket will be loose. Then if I start moving and get tight, is that normal? You know, Linda, a lot of it just depends on the kind of socket that you have, the kind of suspension system um, that you're wearing. Um, for many of my patients, it's usually the opposite. When they first put on their socket, it's a little on the snug side, especially first thing in the morning. And then as they start moving around, it loosens up a little bit and their leg shrinks enough and they have to add a sock or two. Um, so I would say, Linda, again, if there's a socket issue, socket fit, call the prosthetist, see what they can do to help you out, okay? Susan says, proprioception with OI is amazing. You feel so much and you really have a sense as to where your foot leg is without even looking. And again, because you're getting that input directly into the middle of that bone right there, into all that nice juicy bone marrow. All right. Uh... Kay says, I just got my third new socket and liner since my amputation last January. Okay, so here, let me grab another one of these questions here. Okay, so Terry asks, when starting physical therapy and exercising the residual limb and it is burning and sore in the socket and starts to go into cramping, is this normal? When does it get better? Can you still build muscle even though it seems nothing is attached to the bone anymore? I am a 72 year old left above the knee amputee. So Terry, this is a very common question, very good question. And one that I always like to address whenever it's asked on the show. So uh, I like to joke around in my, in my, with my patients that I'm like, if your muscles aren't burning, then I haven't done my job. But the whole no pain, no gain situation isn't always the case. If I'm trying to target a very specific muscle group in my patient, and again, usually it's the gluteus medius, and I tell my patients I'm going to be a pain in their butt. Da -da Crickets chirping. Okay, so when I'm targeting a very specific muscle group and I'm working on it, then I will ask the patient as they are fatiguing, hey, are you feeling it in that area? Are you feeling that muscle burn a little bit? Because as it fatigues, it might feel a little bit of a burn. So Terry, in your case, that might be part of what's going on. If it's getting to the point where it's uncomfortable with the cramping, it might just mean that you're taking it a little too far and you got to back off a little bit on that exercise. So remember, guys, when we have our muscles, if we have a nice, long, juicy muscle like our hamstrings, right? Those puppies are nice and long, right? And they are used to crossing over the hip joint, the back of the hip joint, the back of the knee joint. So it's a long, long muscle. And then with amputation, whew, that muscle gets cut. Well, that muscle is still trying to do the same amount of work that it used to do when it was a nice long muscle, but it doesn't have enough resources. So what happens is it starts to cramp and it starts to get hot and bothered, okay? Um, is it to say that the muscle will not be able to be strengthened in a terrible grammar? Uh, no. It just means that it will never be able to function with the same efficiency that it used to function when it was at its full length. It's just the basic physics and mechanics, okay? And guys, I did a show uh, last year in my three-day live event series on how muscle strengthening works, the physiology behind it. And it's actually on my YouTube channel. So that was, a, I have to admit, really proud of that lecture. And I go into detail as to how a muscle functions how a muscle is stronger, how, it, how you can get it strengthened, and why sometimes it may not always be as strong as it was before, okay? So again, keeping in mind that with therapy and with these strengthening exercises, we're trying to recruit as many muscle fibers as we can. So even the muscles that have been transected, we're going to try to recruit them as much as we can. Are we going to be able to prevent atrophy from happening? No. I have yet to see an amputee in my 18 years of practice that didn't have some degree of atrophy in their transected muscles, <clears throat> meaning the muscles that were cut, okay? For my below the knee amputees, okay, those that work super, super hard and my really high-end athletes, they can have some beautiful thighs, beautiful muscle, I'm a therapist, guys, I look at people's thighs and butts all day, uh, beautiful thighs and beautiful muscles on their, in, on their glutes area, okay? but the part where their calf is, is not going to be what it used to be, okay? But again, we keep trying, right? All right, let's see, Beth Hudson says, 5% gluc and 5% hammy. Beth, I'm not really sure if I understand your question, darling. Can you, can you be a, give me a little more specifics there? 
Hey, Frank, compadre, man. I appreciate you guys joining in. Uh, we got Casey. Will I be at the NTT conference this year? I don't know, Casey. I really, really, really would like to go. I, I went um, when in 2019, I spoke at the uh, San Antonio conference, um, did a full full uh, three days of broadcasting from there. And it was, it was so much fun. It was so wonderful. So I would very much like to go to the MPT National Coalition Conference this year, but it's a little ways away and we'll just have to see how the chips fall. Uh, all right. <laughs> oh, Glenda, thank you. That, that was a really, uh, that was a really fun time. That three-day event was a lot of fun to do. All right. How many of you guys saw that three-day event? How many of you guys remember that from last year, from summertime? It was in July of 2020. Any of y'all remember that one? No? Yeah? No? All right. We've got, hang on. Sorry, it's like my chicken scratch all over the place, writing notes in the margins and everything like this. Oh, this question. Okay, so I don't typically get a lot of questions about pediatrics. Um, so when I do, I always like to try to, to try to answer these questions. So uh, there was a beautiful picture of a young, uh, he, must, he must be, by the looks of the picture, 10, 11 months old, a year tops. You, you guys all, yay. Oh, all of you guys went. That's awesome. Um, so he must have been between 10 or 12 months old. And this little man um, is a bilateral amputee and a bilateral above the knee amputee. And he was wearing stubbies on both legs. So guys, for those of you who aren't familiar, stubbies is basically when um, a bilateral and, and usually used for bilateral amputees, when they wear just the socket and it's like this little goat foot that's put on the bottom of the socket, okay? And it basically allows them to stand on the sockets and on these little tiny goat feet and kind of get used to being upright before they put on knees and feet, okay? So the mom was talking about how he has contractures in both of his hips, meaning that he can't straighten up all the way. And that happens all the time, especially with my above the knee amputees. So in children, it's an even bigger risk. And the reason why is because children, if they're injured or if they're not actively walking, right? <laughs> Jeffrey is like the poster child for how awesome you can be on stubbies <laughs> right there, Jeffrey, right? So a lot of times children will, especially when they're sleeping at night or when they're uncomfortable, they'll adopt the fetal position, meaning, and they'll bring their curl their legs up, which will intensify those hip contractures, okay? So little known fact, I did my first two years as a licensed practicing therapist in the pediatric uh, wards over at Jackson Memorial Hospital. So all the different pediatric wards, the transplant, the cardiac, um, oncology, all the different kinds of wards. And with children, when you do physical therapy, you really have to put it into the context of play, right? You can't tell them, well, lift your leg in this position 50 times because the kid's just gonna laugh at you and, and just not do it, right? Okay. Those of you who have kids, you know exactly where I'm coming from, right? So you have to kind of trick kids into doing what you need them to do for therapy, okay? So a lot of times, and not just children with amputations, a lot of times children with developmental disorders, um, they will experience that a lot of hip tightness that prevents them from standing up. So one of my favorite things to do, and the nurses loved me for this one, I would come into the room and usually there's a wall, right? Just a blank wall in the room. And I would either bring shaving cream or whipped cream. And I would put it on the wall. And I would put something on the floor so that the nurses wouldn't get too mad at me. And then I'd have the foam letters. The kids always have some sort of foam letters or shapes or something like that. And I'd give it to the child and tell them to stick it to the wall. So obviously I would spray the foam, whether it was shaving foam or whipped cream up high. So the child would have to really reach to get the foam onto the shaving cream. And they'd have a good old time getting dirty, making a mess, and not realizing that every time they were reaching up, they were stretching um, those, those hips out, okay? So that was one of the ways, one of the messier ways and more fun ways that I enjoyed getting kids to do that. Another way, and this is also um, for children who are a little bit older and could follow the directions a little bit more, more be a little more cooperative with their therapist who is trying to be creative with them, walking backwards. And honestly, I do this also with my adult patients. Okay. So let's see if we can get Bob to do a moonwalk here. Right. 
So if the person is has the hip flexion contraction, that's like a really exaggerated version. If you have them walk backwards, well, Bob's not, come on, Bob, stay upright for me. If you have them walk backwards, okay, they are constantly putting a stretch on the front of their hip. And the bonus to it is that you're getting them, you're, you're using your body weight to stretch out those hip flexors, which can be much more effective than having your therapist crank on your hip and stretch you out that way. So that was also a nice um, exercise that I would do with kids just for fun, like, okay, let's do a race, walking backwards, who can, who can be the fastest, okay? And once they learned how to walk backwards, then I would have them walk backwards tandem, meaning putting one foot directly behind the other. And that's really going to give a nice stretch to those hip flexors. And it works for grownups as well. That's something I use a lot for balance exercises. Eric, are you listening? And also for stretching out those hip flexors when they get tight. All right, let's see. We got more comments that came in. William, that would be fun. I did do it virtually last year at the, when the, the Amputee Coalition National Conference last year in 2020, obviously it was virtual. Um, and I spoke with, spoke at there as well. And that was a really, really interesting experience. They had some, they had a really neat little setup where you could really interact with everyone. Yes, Casey. And it, and it's, it's amazing. You know, I, I, I enjoyed my time working um, with kids. I, I worked, I actually started off in high school when I decided I wanted to become a physical therapist. I decided I wanted to work exclusively with children. Um, obviously life took a bunch of different turns for me to lead me to this point. Um, but working with children is just, it's just a beautiful thing. I have four of my own. So obviously I, I'm, I'm addicted to children. Um, and there was so much that I learned from development, childhood development and, and their movement patterns and how they develop their gait patterns um, that I apply to my adults. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it was always fun. It was always, oh my gosh, one quick story, guys. I remember one girl, she was the most beautiful little girl. She was about nine months old. She, she had this really horrific tumor in her belly um, and it made her belly protrude out and she didn't want to eat. And they had her, you know, feeding her through tubes and didn't want to eat, didn't want to do anything. And doctor calls me in to go see her. And I cleared it with the doctor first and I brought in chocolate pudding. And I remember she was looking at it and guys, a lot of times children who have developmental delay, they also have issues with texture. They don't like slimy stuff. They don't like different textures because they're not being exposed to it because they're being in the hospital all the time. So they don't get that normal touching everything experience that little babies have. So I plunked this cup of chocolate pudding in front of her and I took a swipe and I just put it on her nose. <laughs> and she, she was like trying to look at it. It was the cutest thing ever. And by the end of it, this beautiful little girl and she had a beautiful little dress, which I felt so bad about smeared chocolate pudding all over herself, all over me. Um, and I learned that lesson real quick. Make sure you put on a smock on the child before you give them chocolate pudding. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Yes, Olga. Tummy time would work with him. But again, he's 10 months old, 11 months old, 12 months old, judging by from what I saw in the picture. So trying to do tummy time with a 10 month old, again, you have to get creative. And again, you can do the same thing putting him on his belly and putting something interesting in front of him that's going to keep him occupied so that he has to get up on prone on elbows. Um, that worked a lot really well for my six months and under kids because it was easier to keep them on their bellies. But man, once they get to 10 months old, they do not want to be on those bellies. They want to be up and moving around, but it's certainly worth a try. All right. Mm -hmm. Jeff says, I have to thank you for the TMR, RPNI show. Oh, good, Jeff. I met with a surgeon today. A separate surgeon will be in the operating room to do a TMR for my surgery. Wonderful. Jeff, if you don't mind, uh, if you don't mind shooting me a message as to who your surgeon is, I always kind of like to have a little bank of, of names because I know there's not too many surgeons out there doing TMR. Um, so I would really love to know the name of your surgeon and where he's he or she is located and, and you know, your follow-up on your surgery. I would love to, Leanne. Oh, thank you, Leanne. I would, I would love to. We'll, we'll, we'll see what's in the deck of cards for me this year. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Oh, good, David. Okay, good. And, and again, for grownups, if you can tolerate being on your belly, 
lying on your belly is a great way to just kind of gently do a passive stretch. I prefer dynamic stretching, meaning moving your body like walking backwards to kind of get those uh, muscles stretched out when they're kind of warmed up when they're walking. Another one, and this is the one my patients really like, <laughs> is um, I'll have my patients, let me see if I can demonstrate with Bob again. Bob, you're getting a workout tonight. All right, so we're gonna pretend uh, Bob is on the mat. <laughs> so weird. I always have a hard time with him. So if you have a hip flexion contracture, I usually recommend taking your sound leg and putting it on the, on the mat, okay? And then, oop, Bob did it just right. Letting that other leg hang off, letting the residual limb hang off the side, okay? And that's another way to kind of gently stretch that out. And the reason why my patients like it is because usually I'll put a hot pack on the top part of their hip just to kind of help them kind of relax that muscle a little bit and let gravity take its effect. And you can also do it with your prosthesis on, whoops, I'm losing my mic. You can also do it with your prosthesis on and that just adds extra weight to kind of help stretch out that hip. All right, let's see, advocating my question on PT knowledge. Yes, Jim, you are up, man. I did not forget your question right here, right here. Wait, hang on. Jeffrey says, I recently did some backwards walking and almost instantly when I went forward, I could tell I was walking better. Isn't that amazing, Jeff? And again, I love doing walking patterns with people because it kind of, I, I tell it's like it scrambles the brain so that when you walk backwards, walk sideways, walk diagonals, walk tandem, and then you tell a person walk forward, all of a sudden they're walking all nice. It's kind of a cool trick. Love it. Oh, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. Dr. Kyle Eberlin did TMR with my at Mass General. Okay, wonderful. I love TMR, guys. Targeted muscle. Okay, Kate. A TMR is targeted muscle reinnervation. So long and short of it, when you do a traditional amputation, they take the nerve, pull it, cut it, and let it retract back into the soft tissue. Um, if it's a, uh, if it doesn't land in the right place, I guess is the best way to ask for, to say it, it's going to start causing a lot of problems with scar tissue and turn into a neuroma, which is incredibly painful. Okay. As some of you have experienced already with targeted muscle re they basically take that nerve ending and they plug it back into a nerve motor point in the muscle. Okay. So they're basically giving that nerve ending something to do. My favorite saying, devil's uh, idle work, idle hands make devil's work. So if that nerve is left flip-flopping around in that soft tissue with nothing to do, it's going to cause trouble with an aroma. But if you give it something to do and plug it back into the muscle, research is showing it's not going to cause as many problems. And down the line, with some of these really fancy bionic devices, they are able to do the, the mind control devices that you see with the upper extremities it's because they have that TMR procedure done that allows the bionic device to pick up on the electrical signals from those nerves. Really cool stuff. Yes, Casey, neuromas stink. All right, let's move on to Jim's question because it's actually a really great question. Jim says, I've been going to physical therapy because of my hip replacement and obtained a script from the doctor. Before establishing or doing my initial visit, I made inquiry if there was a particular physical therapist knowledgeable and having experience with amputees. I was told, oh yes, so-and-so is, and we'll be glad to schedule you with him or her. Well, knowledge and experience are certainly relative as I quickly found myself in the position of instructor rather than patient. Jeez, how many, is this, how many times has this happened to one of you guys? It's okay, I won't take it personally. How many times have you guys been to see a physical therapist and you've been the one teaching the physical therapist? It's okay, I won't tell. This leads to my question for you. Is there an amputee experience certification or possibly pointed question one could or should ask before establishing a therapy partnership? Once the relationship is formed and linked with a particular physician script, it's hard to change or switch providers. So Jim, dirty little secret of mine, okay? The first time I saw an amputee patient, I had no idea what I was doing. Okay. It was about two years into practicing and I was on the surgical floors and I was called in to see a patient who had had, I think it was a kidney procedure, nothing to do with amputation. This, this man had been an amputee for a long time. And I remember reading the chart going, oh dear, I've never worked with an amputee. 
what do I do? And I walked in the room and thank goodness, thank goodness, he was an experienced amputee. And he knew, you know, obviously he knew how to put his leg on, how to manage his socket, how to manage his socks and how to do everything and get his leg on and out the door he went with a walker. But, you know, at the time as a clinician, I was just thinking, I was like, I need to learn more about this. This is not something that we learned as much as we could have in school. And that's kind of also what inspired me to, to go and, and apply for the amputee position at my hospital and the rest is history. Okay, but unfortunately, many of you have already noticed, there's not a whole lot of us out there who specialize in working with amputees. And Jim, one of the reasons, and again, it's, it's a very small reason, but it is a reason, we don't have a specialized certification. Okay, and here's what boggles my mind. The field of physical therapy, my profession was founded, okay, and I believe in, in, it tickled in Civil War, but we really got going in World War I as physician extenders working with amputees and burn patients because that's what you see in war, right? Those are the bulk of the injuries, amputation and burns. And that's how physical therapy got started. So believe me, it boggles my mind that A, we don't have a whole lot of amputee specialists and B, we don't have a certification yet, okay? So what does that mean? Number one, there is a group of therapists headed by a therapist out in California called Torn McLeod, and he has taken it upon himself to petition to have a certification put into place. And we also have organizations like Mission Gate, and y'all have heard me talk about them. They are beyond amazing at the things that they are producing, and they are producing educational series for physical therapists in hopes of gearing it towards a certification and specialization so that we can get the training that we need, okay? So there's no certification. Now, how do you find a therapist who does that? So if you come across a clinic, Jim, and you did the right thing, you asked, is there anybody there who's worked with amputees? Ask to speak to the therapist. And this is something that I really harp on. And guys, this applies also to your prosthetist. If you're in the process of trying to find the right prosthetist, ask to speak to them, okay? Leave a message at their clinic, okay? Just say, hey, I'm thinking about coming to your clinic for an evaluation would you please be able to give me a call and answer my questions? Number one, if they don't call you back within 48 business hours, that's already a red flag, okay, right? Number two, when you call them, just say, hi, you know, I'm an amputee, I've got a hip replacement, I've got a knee replacement, I've got a bursitis, I've got whatever going on, and your clinic said that you work with amputees. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience? Ask them point blank. Guys, you are providing the therapist, you are providing the prosthetist with work, with a job. So it is well within your right to interview them. And I've had plenty of patients who call me, they, they find out about me, they hear about me somewhere and they call me up and they say, uh, hey, this is, I heard you, you work with amputees. So, so uh, I had one guy who said, all right, sweetheart, how many amputees have you really worked with? <laughs> and I said, well, this week or this year, what would you like to know, okay? And again, ask them, have you worked with above the knee amputees? Have you worked with below the knee amputees? How many bilateral amputees have you worked with? Are you familiar with working with a mechanical knee, with a microprocessor knee? Okay, and the therapist who's experienced, they'll have no problems answering these questions. Now, here's a caveat. There are some therapists who may have only worked with one or two amputees. At, at one point in my career, I was that therapist, guys. I was that therapist, okay? And I didn't take it personally when an amputee would come to my clinic and say, yeah, we don't want to work with the rookie. We'll take the senior therapist. All right, fair enough. But the patients who were willing to take a chance with me as the rookie amputee therapist, they found out that I was constantly learning and I would really was dedicated to their cases. And I was working closely with the prosthetist so that we gave them good outcome. Okay. So if you run into a therapist who's only worked with one or two amputee patients, but they, you can tell that they have that desire to learn and to want to help you, you might have a winner there. And a big key to that is gonna be connecting them with your prosthetist, because that's where I did a lot of my learning early on. I had a fantastic physical therapy mentor, but I also had a phenomenal prosthetist that I got to work with and I learned so much from him on troubleshooting a lot of these things. Okay, Jim? And Jim, I can totally appreciate that once you start working 
um, with a particular therapist and you've gone through the prescriptions and insurance approval, that it's a nightmare to try to switch providers. But here's how I see it, Jim. If your insurance provider, let's say they were being feeling generous and they gave you 10 visits, ooh, <laughs> right? And you, by visit number two, you're realizing that this therapist is not working out. It's better to go find and go through all that trouble versus losing another eight visits where you're getting nowhere, where you're getting nowhere. And I know it's a pain to have to do that, but to me, it'd be more painful to keep going to therapy sessions that are doing nothing, especially when you might have a limited number of sessions for the calendar year. And guys, in some cases, it may involve, um, it may involve having to go out of network for your therapist um, to find the one that can help you. Okay, so that's what I have to say about that. So guys, when you, I'll say this, when you find a therapist that works with the amputees, I'm biased, but they are some of the best darn clinicians in our field. They are extremely passionate about what they do. I know here in South Florida, specifically, we have some phenomenal, phenomenal amputee specialists um, and, and that are physical therapists, great to work with. So they're out there, <laughs> you just gotta find them. All right. All right, let's cast up with some of this. <laughs> oh my God, your comment is priceless. She says, in my experience, turns out the PTA knows her, but the PT doesn't, go figure. And again, it all boils down to experience, Olga. PTA stands for physical therapist assistant, okay? So as a physical therapist assistant, instead of um, the four years of training that physical therapists receive, they receive two years of training. And, and they're exactly that, they are our assistant. So they can administer treatment. Um, however, they cannot evaluate and they cannot diagnose some of these uh, functional mobility deficits, okay? And guys, I've worked with some PTAs that have phenomenal experience. Phenomena. You guys heard me say last week, the other famous saying is, you know, the devil knows more because he's old, not because he's the devil. So some of these PTAs that have been in the field for 20, 25, 30 years, okay, they have a lot of great, fantastic knowledge. So yeah, if you have the PTA with 30 years experience and the PT who's wet behind the ear is two years experience, that PTA is going to know a little bit more and hopefully helping, helping the PT out. Uh, like I said, when I was working in the pediatric unit, uh, the only other physical therapist with me was the PTA, and her name was Donna, and, and she was a phenomenal therapist, phenomenal wealth of knowledge, and I learned a lot from her. Um, so me, for me, it's, it's, it's not the PTA and the PT, the training, yes, it is different. It is different training, but also I look at the person's experience, you know, where have they worked? What is their experience level? Okay, crazy, how can we help? Well, okay, I'm, I'm very happy to say, like I said, in, in my field, there's a small group of therapists who are movers and shakers, and they are petitioning to our professional organization. It's called the APTA, the American Physical Therapy Association. It's like our version of the American Medical Association, right? So the APTA is our kind of governing be all end all body. Um, and they are the ones in charge of the specialized certification. So in physical therapy world, we have uh, orthopedic certified specialists, we have cardiac certified specialists, we have pediatric certified specialists, we have all sorts of certified specialists, right? Except for amputees, and we are working on that. Um, so they are, as in any you know, professional organization, there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of procedures that have to be done, um, but there is a group
All right, guys, can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? Hello, 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 hello. Hopefully you should hear me by now because I just disconnected my microphone. Yep, got it. You lost me after I read Kay's comment. Thank you, Casey. Yeah, basically I realized I have this fancy schmancy microphone set. I forgot to plug it in the charge it. So I ran out of battery. Sorry, Kristen. That's my tech girl in the background going. Uh. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for sticking with me. Y'all are so patient to stay with me while I have all these technical mumbo jumbo issues. All right, guys, we're gonna get to the last question. And actually, this was, I'm actually gonna save this question for next week because it's a pretty long explanation. And I wanna make sure I do it justice. So I'm going to take a shorter question. <laughs> All right. So Susan asks, very important question. I'm a right below the knee amputee and the thigh on my prosthetic side seems to be losing all the muscle. My husband says it can't be or I wouldn't be able to walk, but I can't walk up a set of stairs like a two-legged person can. I put my good leg up and then raise up my prosthetic foot up to meet it and then keep repeating that pattern. I've tried so hard and I'll put my good leg up and then try to put my amputated leg up on the next stair and it just sits there. I cannot whatsoever bring my good leg up past the amputee leg because my amp leg is useless on the stairs. Like as if I don't have a leg at all. Is it my thigh muscle? Is my thigh muscle gone completely? And if so, with work, would I ever get it back? Thanks again, cheers. All right, Susan, so basically this kind of ties in nicely. Um, it ties in nicely with what I just said about muscle atrophy and how the muscle works. So in your case, as a below the knee amputee, you're going to experience atrophy throughout all the muscles in your amputated side, okay? Because they haven't been used the way they were used prior to your amputation. Can you prevent this? Yes, in your case, as a below the knee amputee, your gluteal muscles and your thigh muscles can continue to work and you can really work on strengthening them because all of those muscle attachments are intact. Your calf muscles and the muscles on the front part of your shin, what's left of them, yes, those are going to see the most amount of atrophy. But Susan, it's a use it or lose it scenario. You have to get on that strengthening. And again, refer back to my YouTube video on muscle strengthening and physiology. If somebody can like copy and paste that link. That would be so amazing. <laughs> I can't click out of this or I'll lose you guys. Okay. So basically you have to challenge that muscle. You have to challenge it with exercises. And when it comes to going up a stair and pushing up with your amputated leg as a below the knee amputee, your glutes have to be on point. They have to be super duper duper strong because they are compensating for the fact that your lower calf muscles are no longer there. Okay. And again, as an above the knee amputee, it's a different scenario unless you have one of those knees that does let you go up the stairs. As an above the knee amputee, it's, it's you no, know, you, you typically go up the stairs one step at a time. For my below the knee amputees, not only going up, but going down the stairs, I like to teach them to go reciprocally, okay? It's a great strengthening exercise in and of itself. But Susan, it sounds like you've got to do some pre-strengthening and get some of that muscle strengthening back but it is possible, okay? And again, if you haven't been to see a physical therapist, this is what we really do. This is this is where we can really shine for you. Okay, I'm so glad that you could be here. Eric says, I would tell you, Ronnie is the best with my prosthetic. If you're talking about Ronnie from POA, then you are darn skippy right. Ronnie is amazing. Ronnie Dixon is an amazing prosthetist over in Tennessee. I'm, he used to be here in Florida. I was so bummed when he, when he left to go up and up in Tennessee. <laughs> No, guys, it was me. It was me. When the sound goes out, you know, it's something with me. All right, Kay, it was good having you here. Yeah, POA in Chattanooga. That's right, in Tennessee. Uh, Jim says, stairs really challenges the trust you have in your prosthetic device. Absolutely. I mean, you have to make sure that. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, Mark says, climbing a pool ladder. That's actually a really great way to, to start working on the mechanics of it. Mark, good job. Uh, let's see, Casey says, as an AK, I really wish I could go up the stairs normally. And again, Occasionally, like the first one that comes to mind is the uh, Genium X3. Genium X3 is the microprocessor knee that allows you um, to go step over step. Um, and there's a very specific way on how to activate that um, particular process with that knee. 
And, you know, it's a good skill to learn. If I have someone who has a Genium X3, I definitely teach them how to use that particular function of the knee. Um, but it does require a lot of energy, a lot of energy. Um, and for my above the knee amputees, for the most part, going up the steps, they have to go one step at a time. Going down the stairs, however, I try to teach them how to go reciprocal if they have a microprocessor knee. All right, guys. Do I know any of the amputee clinic prosthetists at the Tampa VA? Casey, I, early on when I opened up my clinic, I did make some connections there. And there's a lovely woman who's a director there um, that I am familiar with. But unfortunately, because of the way I have my clinic set up, I'm not able to work directly um, with the VA, which is kind of a bummer for me. I wish I could. Love working with my veterans. Uh, Eric says, my Alex 3, my Alex 2 lets me go up and down the stairs. Okay. Brett says, I use my butt to do the stairs. There we go. Uh, Rebecca says, who is the group from California petitioning the APTA? It's actually not a group from California, Rebecca. Um, it's an, uh, one of the therapists who's leading that petition is from California. It's actually a group uh, here in Facebook. It's a group of uh, those of us physical therapists and clinicians who specialize in working with amputees. Um, so Rebecca, if you're a clinician and you're interested, I'd be more than happy to give you that information. Just send me a message after the show is over. All right. Yeah, I know, Casey. I know, I know. But, you know, uh, do what I can. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and sign off for this evening. As always, thank you for letting me be a part of your lives this evening. If I missed your question, uh, please send it to me. You can email me through my website. You can send me a message through Facebook, Instagram. It's pretty easy to find me and send me a message. If I missed your question, send it back to me so I can answer it um, on next week's show. All right, guys. Uh, please follow me on Instagram, YouTube channel when you get the chance. And we will see you guys, same bat time, same bat channel next week. Bye, guys. God bless.